Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. If you remember from our previous sessions, we are in chapter 6 where we talk about how to believe. And last time we left off, uh, we left off in uh, subchapter 3 where we talked about mind renewal, about the science behind faith, uh, the science of the brain, of the mind, how is the mind renewed and it, it was interesting stuff. There were so many interesting things. And if you remember, we talked about the brain's neuroplasticity and we said that neuroplasticity was defined, is defined as the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections throughout life. Then we talked about what are we made up, made of as human beings. We are made of three things, a spirit, soul and body. We were saying the spirit is the intuition, the place of communion and fellowship with God, the place of conscience. Then we said the soul is basically the mind, both conscious and unconscious or the subconscious. And there is where the uh, intellect is, emotions, free will, long-term memory, all these things. And then we said the body is the physical substance that we can see. And the heart of a person, it's made up mainly of the subconscious mind and of the spirit. These two, especially the, the new, uh, the born again believer, the subconscious mind, the unconscious mind, plus the spirit. That's the heart, the inner man of a person. And we said that the mind consists of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, the subconscious. We said that the conscious mind is active only during the day, but the subconscious is active all the time 24 7 and that we are with one foot in the physical world through the brain and the other foot in the spiritual world through the spirit in the invisible quantum world and then we said the neurons in our brain look like branches in a tree and the the information is stored in proteins in some kind of proteins as temporary memory and then in time if we refresh that information long enough and consistent enough there are some special cells that will carry slowly the information from the conscious mind from those branches, the, they, are, they will carry those proteins in the subconscious mind, in the long-term memory part of our mind. And then we left off at 1 Corinthians 6, 17, where we talked about that the who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. And we were saying that the Holy Spirit is one with the human spirit, is connected with the human spirit, is one substance, one essence. And the human spirit communicates directly with the subconscious mind. The spirit tells things to our subconscious mind. And then from the subconscious mind, they come up to the conscious mind, to our reasoning, to our uh, intellect. And then to the body and to the outside world. So that's how God speaks through the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is connected with our recreated spirit. And the, our spirit is, is, works or manifests itself at the level of our subconscious mind. And then from there it prompts us. It sends us signals, thoughts, things that, we, that he wants to speak to us. Now let's continue today with Colossians. 2 verses 1 to 3 and if you have your bibles ready let's read it together i'll be reading from the new king james version but you're welcome to use any english translation that you have available let's read it together for i want you to know what a great conflict i have for you and those in laodicea and for and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is so powerful. The mystery of God, the mystery of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and then we see in first corinthians 2 16 that we have the mind of christ for who has known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of christ that mind that have access has access 
to all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We have that mind. How? So we see that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. And we have full access to that because we have that mind. We, want, we are one with the Holy Spirit. We are one with the Lord, with His mind. Before being saved, our human spirit is dead and disconnected from God. That's what our human spirit is before salvation. And our subconscious mind is on its own. It functions on its own without the help of the recreated spirit or the help of the Holy Spirit. However, the moment we are born again, our spirit is recreated and the unconscious part of our mind, the subconscious or the inner man, is directly connected to the mind of Christ and to the fullness of God. The moment you come in Christ, your mind, your subconscious mind is connected through the recreated spirit to the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ becomes one with our mind at the subconscious level or unconscious level. And then through there, with the help of the Holy Spirit, flow ideas, guidance, inspiration, faith, power, the life of God. That's how it flows through our... Uh, I, I, show all, I always show uh, as the subconscious mind and the spirit being in this part because it's this... The scientists call it the second brain. It's the lymphatic system here where you feel when you, when you are in fear or you hear a bad news, it's something that it's in your stomach. It's like, it's like a pain. It's like a, an empty thing in your stomach. So here is where you feel. Here is where it's, you release power. You release energy. This part is like the, our second brain. That's how they call it. So the subconscious mind with the spirit is somewhere here. I mean, it's in the brain but it's also here, okay? So that is how we have access to Christ's knowledge and wisdom at the subconscious level. We are not conscious of it, but we have access to it through our subconscious mind. And praying in tongues stimulates and stirs up that free flow of the rivers of life. The Bible says that the, when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come, the rivers of living water will flow out of our innermost being. That innermost being is what I'm talking about. This part, the, our subconscious mind, the spirit, the recreated spirit. That part that we are not conscious of it, but it's, a, it's the biggest part of our lives. It runs 99.9% .9 of our lives and it runs with speeds of over 400 billion operations per second. And that's the innermost being where life flows, where power flows from. Let's read also Romans 12 verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This verse talks about the renewal of the mind. But it's not just renewal of the conscious mind. For you to become aware of certain things or about the moral law. When you renew your mind, it talks also about the subconscious mind, about the heart. You renew the spirit of your mind. You have to let the word of God go into your heart, into your mind. Not just read it and become aware of it at one time and then forget it. You have to refresh that knowledge, refresh that revelation and it'll, it becomes part of you. Humanly speaking, without any help from the Holy Spirit, in order to really make a change in your life and renew your mind, it takes a full 63 days. It takes three cycles of 21 days minimum to change a thought pattern. That is to renew one thought. One cycle is for replacing the thought with something that you want, replacing a bad thought with one new thought, and two cycles of 21 days to stabilize it. So you see, if, uh, one cycle is for when you find out about the new thought, about new knowledge, new revelation, and then you need two more cycles to establish it or to stabilize it. That's humanly speaking and scientifically speaking about our brain. And we are supposed to do that for the rest of our lives as Christians and new, as born-again believers. We can fix about 17 areas of our thought life per year. 
17 changes in a year is more than many people do in their lifetime. If you're consistent enough and you respect these cycles of changing a thought pattern, you could perform 17 changes in your mind in a year, which is more than many people do in their lifetime. And that's exciting. That is why Paul many times talks about being established in Christ or Christ being formed in you because there's, there are two cycles. There is a period where you stabilize, you establish, you form what you learned, what you heard, what, the, what God has revealed to you from his word. But with the Holy Spirit's help, I believe we can change our thought patterns much faster and renew our minds much faster than humanly speaking, those 63 days, those three cycles. But that's kind of the process. You receive new information, new knowledge, new revelation, but then you have to stay on it, not just forget it, and integrate it in your whole framework of beliefs, of doctrine, see if it fits, if it doesn't contradict other things that you already believe. Take a statement or a new doctrine, a new belief, all the way with all its consequences, with all its implications in other areas of your life, in other areas of the spiritual life to see if you do, it doesn't contradict with something else. And that's what meditation is, to take something to its conclusions and then integrate it and start believing it. And then you have to refresh that knowledge, meditate on it more and more until it becomes part of you. And you no longer need to, to remember it. It's just part of you. Whenever you need to talk about it, it's there. It's in your subconscious mind. It's in your heart. Let's read three more passages about this establishment, this settlement. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says this, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. See again, he who establishes us with you in Christ is God. God helps us to get established in Christ, in that mind, in that body of faith, that unity of faith. And to learn how things work in the spiritual realm. Then Colossians 2, 6 to 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving. See again, established in the faith. Galatians 4.19, we read it before. My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. What does Paul want to say here? Until Christ is formed in you. You are connected to Christ at a subconscious level, but then you need to let Christ come out, be formed in you, become part of you, be conscious of it, not just unconscious. Be conscious and use it in a conscious way. The uh, Christ knowledge, Christ wisdom, Christ power. So Christ comes out through you. It's formed in you. You are established in faith. And as I said, there is a stage when you become aware of what God has given you and you start replacing your old thoughts about your identity with the new thoughts from the word of God about who you are, who you have become, your new identity, your new features, your new abilities, capacities, your new character. But that is not enough to find out and start replacing these thoughts. Then you need to refresh them on a regular basis until it becomes part of you, it becomes you, and you're established in it. What I said about driving a car or learning to play a musical instrument. There's a time of establishment until Christ. There's a labor where you need to refresh the knowledge that you got, meditate, speak it out. Philippians 2.12 says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, working out, that's what working out your salvation is. You are saved at the unconscious level. You have the whole salvation. You have healing, prosperity, power, life, love, peace, joy. You are not conscious of them, but you need to draw them out. You need to exercise them and work them out. Work your salvation out. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24, the, uh, the same thing along the same line. Paul says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What I was saying earlier. The spirit of your mind. What is the spirit of your mind? 
It's that unconscious mind with your recreative spirit. That's where you need to be renewed. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So you were recreated according to God in your spirit in true righteousness and holiness. The thing is that uh, in the beginning you are not conscious of it. it. For you it seems like you're the same. You have the same body, the same mind, you think the same way, the same personality because everything happens at a subconscious level, unconscious level. Your spirit is recreated but your spirit now is true righteousness and holiness. Is made up of the in the image of God. So renewing your mind with the word of God one thought at a time is what working out your salvation and putting on the new self means. Through the conscious mind in the frontal lobe, you have the ability, we have the ability to detach ourselves and become, an ob and become observers of ourselves. That's extraordinary. So in the frontal lobe, in our conscious mind, we have this ability from God to detach from ourselves and become observers of ourselves. Analyze our behavior and the programming of the unconscious mind. So when you do something you were not designed to do, something wrong, a sin, uh, an action, you can detach from it in your mind Look at it as your old programming. Consider it an old programming. It's that it's not really you. And decide to start sowing different seeds in your conscious mind. So that you would alter your unconscious mind. And consequently change your toxic programming. So whenever you're tempted to do something wrong, look at it. This is not me. This is not Christ. I am no longer that person. That's not me. That's my old programming. That's my old subconscious who tries, which tries to bring me back into bondage. But the real me is not that. So you have that ability in your frontal lobe of the mind. That's what Carolyn Leaf says to detach because that's the strategy of the devil. To put thoughts in your mind that you will think that they are your thoughts. And then you feel different. Like for instance, lust, passions things that you want to do, you feel them like they are there, your, your own desires. That's why you conclude that you still have sin in you, that you're still a sinner, that you still have a sinful nature. You become guilty because you, you have those thoughts. And you, you, when those thoughts come to your mind, you're thinking like, oh, why am I thinking this? Why am I still, why do I still have these kinds of thoughts, this lust, this, this temptations, these desires? But they are not really you. And you have to detach yourself from that and separate yourself and in faith see it that you are someone else. And you have to get rid of those thoughts even if you feel like they are, there, they are your own, they are not. Because now you are created in the image of God. And you have to learn whenever you feel for instance discouragement, worry, fear, you're tired, that's not you. That's your old programming. When you have feelings of unrest, anxiety, decide, wait a minute, this is not me. This is my mind playing tricks on me. The real me is full of joy, full of peace, is righteousness. And you start speaking in tongues, you start worshiping and then generate whatever it's inside of you. So the, our mind is extraordinarily built by God, created by God. So the real, the real you, the real me, is made up in God's image in righteousness, in holiness. So many times I detach myself and when I'm, I feel certain things or certain desires, I, I tell myself, this is not Christ. Christ can never be offended. Christ never thinks about this. Christ can never do this, these things, so I don't do them because they are not me. Even though I'm tempted, I'm, I feel these things, they are not me. They are my mind, the old programming which needs to be deleted. And you can now. The Bible says, do not let your sin reign in your mortal body. You are dead to sin. Your spirit is dead to sin. You are alive to righteousness. You are dead to sickness. You are alive to healing. So even when sickness comes on your body, that sickness, Christ cannot be sick. That's what I tell myself, Christ cannot be sick. I am Christ. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. So I cannot be sick. Sickness, out. That's how you, you need to start thinking and replace your human old identity 
with the new identity of Christ. It's not something, uh, it has to become something part of you. When, that, when somebody asks you, so many times I play jokes, but it's a reality, and I call myself Edward Christ. Not Edward Sere Duke, but Edward Christ, because I'm in the family of Christ. My last name is Christ. I have its Christ nature. I have Christ mind, Christ knowledge, Christ healing, Christ power, Christ uh, holiness. And I have to learn to think that way. Let's read James 1.21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And Proverbs 4.23, and I'll say what I, want, I will say in a minute what I want to show with these two passages. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So the word of God is already implanted in your spirit because the word also says in 1 Peter 1.23 that we were created, we were recreated through the imperishable seed of the word of God, from the word of God. So the word of God is implanted in our new spirit. It just needs to come out and be unlocked by the renewing of our subconscious mind with the word of God. That means receiving and believing the word. That's how you renew your subconscious mind, the spirit of, of the mind. Once the word you read and meditate on and personalize becomes a conviction or a belief in your subconscious mind, that is what allows the power of God to flow and save your soul and body by healing here on earth. That's how the implanted word at subconscious level will save your soul, your body, your for the, from the negative things happening in this world. You will become immune to those things through the word that is implanted in your spirit. When you build convictions and beliefs that align themselves with the word implanted in you, that's when power is unlocked. Life is unlocked for you and for other people around you. So you have this ability to detach and put new thoughts in your conscious mind that will slowly go to the unconscious mind and you re help you release more power and more uh, life. That is why the Bible insists so much on guarding and keeping our hearts with all diligence because from there we create our reality and our world. Everything that surrounds us, not the world, physical world, but our world, our relationships, our friends, our, our uh, prosperity, our job, everything that's around us, our, our world. Every person has his or her own world that revolves around that person, things that happen to that person, bad or, or good, persons that come in, the, in that person's life, people, relationships, jobs, all these things make up a person's world. So from there, you create your reality and your world through your words, through your thinking pattern. The heart, I was saying, is the subconscious and the spirit. That part of you has the ability to dictate what happens in your life. Bad things or good things. Amen? Our heart is the inner man encapsulating the unconscious mind and the spirit, as I said before. Now, one important thing before I close this subsection about the science of the mind and of faith. Just because the brain, physical brain, is neuroplastic, be careful not to change yourself through your human efforts. That is possible to some degree. That's why we see uh, a lot of people being moral, doing good things, being good people. But that doesn't last. It's more difficult to, to change yourself through human efforts. It takes more cycles, more days, and it's not permanent. It's not always permanent if you try to change yourself. Instead, replace the old thoughts and habits with what the Word of God says about you, about your new identity, and with faith in the Word, conviction in the Word. That will release the supernatural power of God from inside of you for change. It will release grace for change, power to change. You will have a help 
So you will not be on your own. So take the word of God, believe what it says about you, that you are dead to sin. You can walk in holiness. It's possible. You don't have two natures. You have only one nature of God. You have healing locked inside of you. You have prosperity. You are rich. You are a success. These things, meditate on them and then start leaving them out. And you'll have the power of God. The more you believe them, the power of God will catapult you and will change you exponentially faster. Amen? So here is, is where I conclude this, this science of the of faith, science of mind renewal. How is our mind renewed with the things of God and in the area of healing, divine healing? How to renew your mind to believe the word of God about healing? And I hope it helped you. Now let's move on to the fourth Subchapter where we talk about faith releasers, factors that influence our faith from inside in a, in a good way and it helps that faith to be released more. Faith releasers. And let's read one passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the ob obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the fight of faith is the battle of our minds to stay on the word in all the areas of our life and in the area of healing. That's what we're talking about here. To, to keep your mind on what the word of God says about healing, about your healing, no matter what you see or feel or hear. And the divine weapons that God has given us for this warfare of the mind, the warfare is mainly in your mind. Is to keep your mind, to fight, to keep your mind in the Word. The weapons that God has given us to win this fight in our mind is first the Word, second praise and worship, third prayer in tongues, and fourth fasting. These are the main four factors that influence or release our faith more from our spirit. These are the main four weapons. There are Maybe there are more, but these are I, the one that I found to be the most uh, powerful, the most accurate, the most uh, efficient in releasing our faith into, from the spirit into the outside world. Let's see now, how does the word, how does praise and worship, fasting and praying assist us in growing our convictions or in releasing more of the faith that we received at the moment of salvation? The first one, the word of God. How does the word of God assist us in releasing our faith? First, you get accurate knowledge and revelation about what to believe in an area and in every area of your life and how to believe. That's what we're doing here. We're talking about healing. We're talking about what to believe from the Bible about healing and how to believe, how to release your faith and about what exactly applies to you as a Christian, as a new creation and what you can expect to happen anytime, anywhere. That's what the Word of God can give us. Accurate revelation, accurate knowledge about what we are entitled to, what we have a right to and a responsibility to, and what we can expect to happen in our lives. And we see in Philemon chapter 1, is only one chapter, verse 6, the Bible says this, that the sharing of your faith may become effective, so your faith may become effective, by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. This verse says that your faith, the fellowship of your faith, the manifestation of your faith becomes effective. It starts working when you acknowledge, you recognize every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. When you start realizing what God has put in you in Christ Jesus, and you get knowledge about what God has given you or what he has already given you, that's when faith starts, begins to become effective, to operate, to work in your life. Amen? This is so powerful. The second way the word helps us, regular meditation on the things that we just said, the things that you became uh, aware of, 
well, then you need to meditate on them. How? Memorize them. Memorize verses that talk about you. Personalize them. Speak them out when you pray. Speak them uh, at the, uh, of the first person. I am this. I do this. I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have become a life-giving spirit as the last Adam uh, has become. I am born from above. I have been born of God and I overcome the world by faith. 1 John 5, 4. As Christ is, so am I in this world. 1 John 4, 17. So you take all these verses and you memorize them daily. I have an app that I'm using that to memorize every day two verses and repeat them. I have over 300 verses that talk about my new identity, about who I am. And I repeat them every day. I personalize them. I pray over them. So that's how I... I allow the word of God to release more faith out of me. So you speak them out and then you, uh, and the, this meditation, this speaking acts directly on your conscious mind by keeping fresh and refreshed the promises of God. And indirectly, it acts on your subconscious mind because you have those cells that, that take this information, this, these revelations and carry them in your heart in time if you refresh them if you meditate on them and then after that when you have those things in your uh, subconscious mind they generate feelings and emotions accordingly corresponding to those revelations that's why you will begin to have more peace more joy more rest more uh, less fear because those things that are inside of you will generate a continuous uh, state of peace, of joy, of rest. That's what we need to get to. It allows the power of the Spirit to be stirred up in you. When you hear the Word, when you are under a sermon of faith and you hear what the Word of God says, uh, isn't that right that after half an hour, even less, you begin to feel something, you begin to feel refreshed, stirred up, emboldened, strengthened if you're listening to the Word of God and you allow it to speak to you. That's what happens. Your conscious mind receives the Word, then it goes to subconscious mind and it generates those feelings, that power. So that's how the Word helps us release more faith. The Word is a faith releaser. The second weapon, praise and worship which helps us release faith. Let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. It says this, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In King James Version it says, Speaking to yourselves, speaking to yourselves in hymns, and sounds, but the new king, new King James changed it, changed it to speaking to one another because to them it didn't make sense to speaking to yourselves, but it makes perfect sense. You speak to yourself, hymns, songs, psalms, and spiritual songs, and to God. You start speaking and praising God, but you speak also to yourself, and you sing. You make melody in your heart to the Lord. What does this verse say? It says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. How? By singing, praising, worshiping, singing spiritual songs. So why does it compare wine, uh, praise and worship with wine and being drunk? What does a person, what does a human being do when they want to relax usually in a negative way? They either go drink just to lose their mind and become unconscious and become happy. Some of them sing, they act crazy. Uh, so they drink alcohol, they take drugs, right, to relax, to, to just detach from this world. So I think praise and worship, what I'm saying, uh, what I'm going to say now, it may seem crazy, but that's what it is, what, that's what it does. Praise and worship can act as a drug, as wine, and it helps you relax when you sing. You relax and you rest. If you remember in the Old Testament, there was a prophet, if I'm not mistaken, Elisha probably, but it doesn't matter. There was a, a prophet who said, bring me a musician. He was angry. He was offended. And he said, bring me a musician. And a musician came and started singing and playing the harp. And the prophet became relaxed and rested. And he was able to prophesy. He was able to minister again. And he was able to connect with God. So music 
is divine. Music has something in it that helps us relax, helps us detach from the physical world and lose ourselves, lose our conscious mind, become uh, unaware of things that make us worry, things that try to attack us, fears, anxieties. Music does that, relaxes us. And it's like wine or drugs. It generates joy, peace, relaxation, rest, and it stirs up the spirit. That's what praise and worship does. It starts consciously. You start praising consciously, and then it affects the subconscious and the feelings. It cleanses you from all the negative feelings, blocking feelings generated by what you see and hear in the outside world. Those feelings of worry, fear, anxiety, tiredness, etc., etc., it helps you relax when you praise and worship God. It brings feelings of confidence and boldness and creates a platform for your mind to believe the word easier and act on the word easier so that the power of the Spirit from within us can be released. So that's what we're doing when we're praising God and worshiping God. We focus on something else that, on something else than the, uh, the physical world. We focus on God, we praise Him, we sing Him, and we lose ourselves. We connect with God and we forget about all these things that come into our conscious mind. And all that atmosphere, basically you expose your conscious mind to that atmosphere, and that atmosphere affects your subconscious mind and then generates, uh, brings out the peace, the joy that is already inside of you. It just needs to be released. And praise and worship does that. Let's see how we are supposed to praise and worship. John 4, 23. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Spirit and truth. What does worship in spirit means or worship in the truth? The Father must be worshiped in spirit. That means speaking and singing in tongues. You allow the Holy Spirit to speak and sing through in tongues or create those spiritual songs. You can also sing in the Spirit in English or Romanian or your own native language and allow the Holy Spirit to create new words, but it's mainly in tongues. And wherever you see in the Bible, praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues, praying through the language that you received at the moment of salvation. So that's how mainly the Father wants to be worshipped in tongues, in the spirit, and in truth. What is in truth? Confessing and singing the personalized, personalized truth about God and you. You begin saying verses from the Bible that you have already personalized. I am the new creation in Christ Jesus. God, you are holy. You are all awesome. You are a king and priest. I worship you. I praise you. You have made me a new creation. You have given me joy, peace, love, grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. So you start declaring those things in praising and, worship, in praising and worshiping God. And you allow the word of God, the truth that you know, to come out through your mouth. And that's how you worship God in truth. That's why it's important what songs you sing and what are the lyrics of the song saying. If they are saying a present truth or a truth of the Old Testament that doesn't apply to you anymore. If you sing those, the, that kind of songs, they will not help you release more of your faith because if they contain... Uh, they contain things that are not truth. Amen? So that's how you have to be careful what are you singing. The lyrics have to be aligned to the truth of God about the new creation, about who you have become, what uh, does apply to you in the New Testament. There are songs that talk about Elijah, the days of Elijah, the days of, uh, the days of Elisha, of David. No! Today we live in the days of the new creation, not the days of David. And we are no longer sinners. We, we were sinners. We are a new creation now. So there's no point in singing that I am broken. No, you're not broken. You feel broken because that's your old nature. So how can I sing I'm broken and discouraged? Even if I feel discouraged, I will not confess that because that's not the truth. The truth is that I am full of peace, I am a new creation, I am full of the Holy Spirit, I am full of joy, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what I need to confess through my Psalms, 
not the things that I feel. I hear all these romantic songs uh, that talk a lot about uh, how we feel about our human uh, uh, feelings and they don't, they basically worship humans. They don't focus on who God is, on thanking Him, on, on, pra on uh, praising Him in truth and focusing on what we have become. If you are to focus on you, at least focus on the real you, the new you in Christ Jesus. Amen? So it's important how we praise and worship so that faith will be released more from us. Let's read one more passage, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is peace, joy in the Holy Spirit and righteousness. What does it mean for you to seek the kingdom of God? It means to seek to have these things, to manifest these things. When you start manifesting joy, manifesting peace, you're seeking the kingdom of God. When you start walking in righteousness, thinking about this, speaking them out, seeking them, you're seeking the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God becomes more real to you. You become more aware of the kingdom of God that is already present, is in your heart, is in you. And you start manifesting that kingdom. So praise and worship is the second powerful faith releaser if you know how to do it right and to use it right. Amen. The third faith releaser in the area of healing and other areas of your spiritual life is prayer in tongues. This is very powerful and very neglected by the body of Christ. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Building yourselves up. What is yourself? Building your mind, unrenewed mind. Building your body, yourselves up on, on what? On your most holy faith that is inside of you, in your spirit. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. That's how you bring your mind and you align it with the Spirit, with the faith that's inside of you. And praying in tongues, it's, it's, it's powerful. It bypasses the conscious mind. It bypasses the reasoning, the frontal lobe, the intellect, and builds conviction about the Word of God directly into your subconscious mind because you hear those words. And those words are, speak, uh, are spoken in the spiritual realm and they have access directly to your subconscious mind. You, the word goes through your conscious mind and then to the subconscious. But praying in tongues affects your heart directly. The Holy Spirit is allowed to alter your mind. And research has shown that when you pray in tongues, they did research on praying in tongues. It has shown that when you pray in tongues, your frontal lobe, where the reasoning takes place, has no activity. When you speak in tongues, you speak mysteries from God to your own mind and to the spiritual world. It speaks mystery in the, mysteries in the spiritual realm that affect your spirit, your mind, and your body in a positive way. Even your body. Research has shown that your body's immunity grows when you pray in tongues more. With the, they were saying something like 60%. You're more, more immune to sickness when you pray in tongues. So when the Bible says that you're building yourself up, it's not just your mind. It's, it also builds your body. It makes your body physically more immune to sickness and to darkness. Amen? That's how powerful praying in tongues is. The Holy Spirit has a chance also to witness. I was talking about the court of law in your heart. The Holy Spirit also, how does He build conviction directly into your subconscious mind in your heart? He has a chance to witness directly to your heart and to your subconscious about the Word of God. In other words, He puts flesh to the Word of God that you know directly into your heart without your effort. You just pray, you disable the frontal lobe, the reasoning, and you allow the Holy Spirit to work on your heart. And all of a sudden, you see new ideas coming to you, you have more understanding, you have insight, even in practical things at work, things that you've never thought before, ideas. You start picking up signals, things from the spiritual realm. It's because you prayed in tongues. Decisions. You, you see that you were protected. You just turned right your car and you were, you were protected from a big accident. How did that happen? 
because your mind, your heart, your reactions, your unconscious reactions, they were worked on by the Holy Spirit. That's how you dictate the outside world, your world. And you, you start seeing uh, only good things coming to your life. You start seeing God working all things together for your good because you allow the Holy Spirit to change your heart, to put things inside of you that you are not conscious of, but you will see them manifesting. Amen. It might, be, it might seem weird to you in the beginning, the things that I'm talking, but think about this. Have you ever seen movies when they, where they did mind experiments and they had some uh, hidden agents in different parts of the world they, that they were activated by a certain sound sequence. They would receive a call and there would be a, like a, a weird sound and their mind will be activated. They will be activated to do something that they were not conscious of. Have you seen this kind of movies? So your mind is, a, is very complex. And these weird sounds that come, come out of your mouth, they do something. The spirit does something into you, activates you, allows faith to be released more of you. And if you see God throughout the Bible and the Bible Tower when he gave the languages, and if you think of how many languages, how many dialects, how many hundreds and hundreds of languages are on the face of this earth today, you will see that God has a knack for languages. He loves languages. So he gave us angelic language when he gave us the tongues to speak things that we cannot speak in the natural realm and to allow us to be catapulted to faster into a spiritual realm where we can live a supernatural life. I'm so excited about this subject. This is a, a new series that I'm preparing. It will be in the future. Speaking in tongues also speaks about your future. Either you intercede for others when you speak in tongues. The more you pray in tongues, the further the Spirit of God emanates from you. So that even when you pass near someone, they can sense the Spirit of God in you. People can sense the Spirit of God. Especially if you pass near a witch, they will sense the power in you. And it's, there are so many testimonies of, uh, of things, uh, uh, things like that happening in the world. The Spirit of God starts emanating from you. And in Acts chapter 5, verses 15 to 16, when it says that Peter's shadow was healing people, it wasn't actually Peter's shadow. I mean, it was Peter's shadow which healed, but it was more the Spirit emanation of life from him. He was emanating life. So that's why he shadowed his aura, if you want. His, uh, he was emanating power. It was healing people when he passed them. That's so awesome. That changes completely what we thought about the Christian life. And now you, I think you have more desire to pray in tongues and to not neglect it anymore. And to praise God and worship Him and to, to take the Word of God because you know now what it does to you. And the fourth weapon or a faith release that we're talking today is fasting. Regular fasting weakens the flesh, the reasoning, and strengthens the mind according to the Spirit. You grow in self-control. It strengthens the determination and the sober-mindedness. You know, but the Bible says in a few places, be sober-minded, be steadfast. You, you, uh, fasting strengthens your mind, your resolve. You are many times tempted to eat and you say no during a fast. That self-control then leaks into other areas. If you learn to say no to a best basic need like food, then it will be easier for you to say no to other things that tempt you. It will be easier after that to not give in to what you see or feel. And that contradicts the word of God. But stand on the word that you know in all the areas, in the areas of, especially in the area of healing, since we are talking about healing. Amen. So when you fast, the determination, the resolve, the self-control that you gain there, then it will leak in all the other areas. That's why fasting helps us remove unbelief because you train your mind to say no to your five senses. And uh, I gave this uh, analogy before the David's principle. He was able to kill the bear, the lion. That's what helped him to kill the giant. So when you fast, all kinds of thoughts like the following come to your mind and you have to block them so that you won't yield to them. And I know these thoughts how? 
because I fasted, I trained myself to fast regularly, even days in a row to fast, not eat uh, the whole day. And I can tell what thoughts came to my mind. So I'll tell them here. The first thought, you know, you cannot last too long in this fasting thing or habit that you're trying to do. So why torment yourself? Just give up and eat. Just give in and eat. That's the thirst. That's one of the thoughts that comes. You know that you won't last. It will not last. It's something temporary. So why torment yourself? Just give in and eat. That's one thought. The second thought. You know you cannot do this on a permanent basis. So why bother? Why even try to fast? Just give in and eat. That's another thought. The second thought. The third thought. Nobody sees what you're doing. Nobody can praise you about it. So why bother? Nobody can give you, say, oh, you're doing good. Oh, you are so spiritual. So why bother fasting? That's the third thought that you need to, to, to fight with. Another thought. Your body needs food to function well. And you know that. You're working hard and your body needs food. That's what science says. Your body needs food. Otherwise, you'll be cranky all day and you'll be ineffective. You'll be weak all day. You need to eat. So that's another thought that comes. And then maybe a lot of other thoughts that come to your mind. They are specific to you. But these kind of thoughts you have to fight with. And they are very similar with the thoughts of doubt that come when you try to minister healing to someone. So that's how fasting helps you. you. know, there was a time in my life a few years back when I didn't even want to hear about fasting. And my wife laughs about that. I didn't want to hear about fasting. I didn't like fasting. And I even started to build a doctrine that fasting is not for the New Testament. It's only for the Old Testament. Because if I didn't fast, I needed to have some biblical support for it because I, I'm teaching the Bible. So why don't I fast? But then the Holy Spirit took me slowly and showed me what, what is fasting doing to me and to my faith. How does it help to release faith? And now I, when I understood what fasting does in the New Testament, now I was excited about fasting. Now I wanted to do it to the point where I, I, I started to, to work on doing it a habit, doing daily, like eating, not eating like 18, 16, 80 hours in 24 hours a day, like from 6 in the evening until 12 the next day. It's called intermittent fasting or not eating at all, eating one meal a day, not eating, eating only in the evening from 5 to 6 or from 6 to 7 and doing that for days in a row, for months. Oh, you lose some weight too, but that's not, a, that's not the issue. You build so much self-control and you feel so in control of your life and your mind, like after that, whenever I saw things that used to tempt me, like drinks, sodas, uh, things that I, I would put weight on, like uh, croissants, it was so easy to say no. But also when you minister healing and doubt comes to your mind, it's so easy to say no. To say no to those and keep your mind on the word because you have built that sober mindedness, that determination through fasting. So that's what fasting does. And that's how fasting re helps us release more faith. It's something that God gave us to help us to live in faith all the time. So it's ideal to find your own, to, to make a habit of fasting on a regular basis. Uh, to do your own rhythm, like one day fast, the other day no, or, or two days a week, or every day fasting for a, few, uh, a number of hours. It's a very good exercise. It's a weapon. It's a, it's a fact. It's something that helps you live in faith all the time and not give in to the flesh. So all these four are helpers to stimulate and refresh your conviction about the word. They help you fo focus your mind. They bless God's heart when you praise and worship, but they also work mostly on you and increase the release of your faith. Healing and casting demons out or raising the dead are not affected directly by these things, by these four things. You yourself are affected and then you release more or less power, more or less faith. If healing had come by how strong I am, how much I prayed, how much I fasted, then I should pray in the following way. Be healed in the name of Edward. Because I fasted, I prayed, I praised and worshipped, so be healed in the name of Edward. But we don't pray like that. 
It is the name of Jesus that has the power and the reputation that you carry, not yourself. You just have the power of attorney. You have his power in you. You have become one with you. So it's not trying you to force yourself to pray, to do this so that I'll release more power. No, you just get yourself out of the way. Jesus is the power. It's his name who is powerful. It's the word of God which is powerful, not you. Prayer and fasting doesn't give you more power. It just releases more of the power that is already in you by peeling off the layers and blockages stopping it. If you put your faith in prayer and fasting, then there will never be a time, as I said before, when you feel that you prayed or fasted enough to be able to minister to the sick. It will always cause doubt in your mind if you put your trust in your how much you prayed, how much you uh, prayed or fasted. And now I'll give you an example, the onion example. Christians are like onions. <laughs> That's funny, but they are. You go to the store, buy an onion, you come home and put it on the counter. No problem. It sits there. Maybe it sits there or in the fridge. It sits for a long time. Not a problem. But then one day you start peeling those layers off because you need the onion for food. And the minute you start peeling them off, what happens? That aroma starts to spread in the room. The aroma of the onion. Now that aroma which got stronger in the room, it was always there in the onion, in the fridge or on the counter. It was always there. But now when you peeled it off, the aroma was just released. With born again believers, God has put in us his spirit, his fullness. The same spirit that was in Jesus and who raised Jesus from the dead is in us. From the moment you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you. The whole power of God is in you. This Spirit is very powerful, but He doesn't grow in power. He always has the same power. Isn't that right? The Holy Spirit has always the same power. He doesn't grow in power. So the variation in power is caused by what? By who? By the human layers, by the mind blockages, the strongholds of the mind, which are peeled off layer by layer through the word of God, through prayer. And you don't grow in power or anointing. You are anointed once for all time, forever. We're anointed of God and that anointing is forever. You don't grow in power or anointing. What happens is what John the Baptist said. You decrease and he increases. That's the process. You either have the power or you don't. So you're either a, uh, an unbeliever who doesn't have the power or you're a Christian who receives salvation, who receives the Holy Spirit and you have the whole power. But the, the level, the variation of, in the release of power, it's dependent on this process. You have to decrease, you have to peel off those strongholds of the mind so that more power, more of Christ increases and comes out and is manifested. It is more difficult when we talk about healing, about the area of healing, it is more difficult until you get the first victories because you have to push through. In the beginning, it's a little bit difficult because you have to renew your mind. Things are new. You're not used with this. But after you get a few victories, no matter how small, those victories create powerful markers in your mind that catapult and strengthen your faith for future battles. So if you have a few victories, then you'll be more, you'll be more confident, more, bolder to face new challenges. That is why we need to exercise our faith and press in, press on until we see results, until we get results, until we see people healed. We can also do certain actions that help our faith, like declaring, like speaking to ourselves, as I said before. And usually there are three stages in the healing ministry. First stage the battle until you get the first healing. So you renew your mind, you speak, you get the word in you, you pray in tongues, you worship, and it takes a while, and then you pray for someone, nothing happens. Pray for another person, nothing happens. Even worse, you pray for people and they die. How it happened to me, twice or three times. And yes, of course, I was discouraged in my faith for a while, for months, until I pulled myself again up, and started believing again. So yes, you pray and then you might see failures, you might not see anything, but push through until you see the first victory. The second stage is coasting, where healing becomes a normal thing in your life. You start healing day to day, whatever, whatever, 
where whoever you meet, whoever needs it, you start uh, putting your hands and healing them and coasting. So that's coasting. Third level is when you hit a wall. You hit a sickness and nothing happens. Then it means you have been entangled with life and you have to push through. You have to get back to the word, get back to prayer, get back to word praising and worship so that you release more of, of that power. And when you pray for a sickness and get results, your faith and conviction will increase in that area and for that particular sickness. If you get results in a, for a sickness, you pray for someone sick of cancer and it's healed. Now you have more faith for that sickness. When you pray for another person to be healed of cancer, then you have more faith and it's more instant, much faster. It will be easier next time. But we want to increase faith for all sicknesses. So you have to allow that victory in one sickness to also leak in, for other sicknesses when you, when you face other problems. So we use David's principle of association and, uh, or leaking analogy. As I said, relate past victories to current situations. So make it benefit from those victories. Relate past victories to current situations. That's what David did. The Lord was with me when I killed the lion and the bear. Smaller things. The Lord will also be with me to kill this Goliath. Bigger things or the current situation. That's how you grow in your conviction. So you can begin with smaller things like headaches, fevers. Start praying for them. Don't take immediately pills or medicine. If you have an opportunity, search for opportunities to grow your faith, to pray for things like that, for yourself, for other people. When you see someone sick, oh, you are sick? Let me pray for you. Because you have an opportunity to exercise your faith and to grow in it. Pray for headaches, for fever, for, for mom, for women that cannot bear children, for, I don't know, for any sickness. But start with smaller things if it helps you and then grow to bigger things and attack bigger things. Slowly move into more difficult things. Amen? So today we finalize subchapter 3 where we talked about the science of faith and the science of mind renewal. And we also talked about faith releasers, which were four. The word, praise and worship, fasting and praying in tongues. And we talked how to how to release more of the faith inside us. In uh, our next sessions, we'll continue talking about faith blockers and about other things related to how to believe, how to allow faith to be released more in your life. It's a whole chapter and we'll talk about and there are exciting things coming ahead of us, even more exciting. But until we see again each other, I pray that God will bless you, give you more revelation and help you release more of the faith, more of the things that he has put in you, of those good things that he has put in you to help you acknowledge them, realize that they are in you and then start releasing them using the principles that we talked about. Amen.